Okay. Good morning. Welcome everybody to this class BC three one zero on church and ministry administration. We are going to uh, we're going to have two hours today and uh, learn some good things. Um, let's pray and then we will get started. May I request somebody just to lead us in prayer and then we could start. Anybody can pray. All right. Go ahead, Charles. I think you're going to pray. Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again that you are allowing us to meet to study your word. We thank you that because you chose us, we can take it for granted that we are doing this. The follow as you promised in Ezekiel that you are giving us a heart of flesh. Lord, we pray that you will give us a heart that is able to be permeable enough to absorb the information that you want us to study. I pray for our lecturer that you will bless him, give him the right words and the Holy Spirit's action that he will be able to deliver what you wanted him to do. Mm -hmm. And that even those that are yet to join, that they will be able to join. I pray for connectivity, for internet and everything, mm -hmm. batteries and gadgets that they will be charged, will be able to study. When Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining the class today. Um, we, uh, I'm, I'm just going to quickly review what we talked about last week uh, as we, as we continue in this journey on uh, learning about church and ministry administration. So, what we said in the very beginning is that you know God is a God out of order, organization, and. Uh, yeah, and so we are actually following God when we organize, when we do things properly. And um, if we combine uh, the spiritual ministry that we are all called to do with good administration, good organization, then we will be more effective in serving people. We can serve people well. And so, with that, we began our journey. Uh, we started talking last week uh, about um, uh, the first step, which is to form a legal entity for your ministry or a church. You know, so that uh, from a from a civil or a government perspective, uh, we should be clear. Right. So uh, it shouldn't be that we are doing things that uh, we are legally not entitled to do so it's always good uh, as you uh, when, whenever you're ready and when you're about to start your ministry and get things going whether it's a local church or whether it's some other type of christian ministry to form a legal entity uh, in your country have it give it a name and uh, uh, and and so then you can you know, do things properly, legally. And of course, the government backs you up when you are a legal entity. Uh, you have certain privileges uh, in the country or in the place where you're operating. There were some things I just wanted to finish up from that uh, chapter, which we will do now and then move forward from there. So I'm just sharing um, uh, that chapter three. Now, church trust, the word trust, actually, it's what we call it in India. But uh, uh, in other countries, you know, you may be using a different word. Uh, for example, in the U.S., they talk about a non-profit, um, a non-profit organization or a religious non-profit, you know. So, uh, but we here, we call it a trust, a religious trust. So, uh, Either you, uh, it's important to form this legal entity. We talked about it last week. 
And, you know, you, you have, when you form a legal entity, you need your initial core group of, uh, you know, um, members. Um, they would be the founding members or the trustees or the office bearers or the board of directors or directors, you know, whatever, different, different places, they call it different. But you need to select people who are aligned to your vision. The Articles of Incorporation, or what we call as trust deed, basically gives what this legal entity is about and what can be done and what cannot be done. And what I suggested was that try to make it as broad in scope as possible because even though initially when you start out, you may be starting out with just one area of work and ministry, uh, you should be able to grow you know, in the years to come. You should be able to add uh, many different kinds of ministries to what you're doing. So try to keep it broad so that in the future, when you want to start something uh, under that same name or under that same legal entity, you should have the freedom to start. Now, of course, when you form a legal entity, you also we also need to fo follow the government regulations. You know, whatever the regulatory filings are in your country or in your city, uh, you need to do that. And every, annually, they will usually tell you to file, you know, your uh, income uh, report. So well, all the funds that came in, you, uh, you, you file it, you show where the money came from and where the, uh, where, how much money came and where it went. Um, and and uh, if you are having uh, staff, then you would, uh, most, most places, you would have to deduct income tax. If you're paying them salaries, you pay that tax to the government. So you show them that you're doing those um, you know, those reg regulatory filings, so these kinds of things. Now, usually, uh, if you engage a chartered accountant, uh, they will handle all of this for you, you know, an accounting firm, um, as part of your, uh, your, you hire them for their service, they will take care of all this for you and make sure everything is good. But the point is, when you form a legal entity, there are obviously regulations, government regulations that we must follow. The last thing I just want to point out is that in addition to the uh, the office bearers, the directors, the, the people who are legally named on that entity, people of <clears throat> you know the, the on the board, you could also have additionally, and I'm not saying this is necessary, but I'm just giving this as a suggestion. You could also have an additional advisory board or a group of people who are advisors. They are not legally responsible for the organization, right? Because their names are not on the legal entity. But they can provide guidance to the people who are responsible. So you call them an advisory board or advisors or board of advisors and so on. Um, so that's something you know it would be nice to have if possible now when we started apc for a long time we didn't have an advisory board uh, one reason was i mean we were very small nobody bothered about us uh, you know we were just uh, unknown uh, um, but then later on i think just a couple of years ago a few years ago you know when we we kind of were more or less established, and there were more people settled as part of the church, and uh, and uh, I, I, I pref uh, intentionally I chose to have people uh, who were from within the church as opposed to from outside the church. So you know there are pros and cons to do that. Some churches or organizations would have an advisory board of people from outside the church you know, and i've heard of uh, very large organizations who would have uh, uh, members in the advisory board who would be from different parts of the world uh, because um, they're a global organization and when you have people like that on your advisory board of course they can give you input um, that is very global in nature but then you need to have access to those kinds of people so uh, but what i i chose to do uh, a few years ago was to 
you know, once we had some pe good people settled within the church, uh, to pick out a few people from them and invite them uh, to be part of the advisory board. Just to, you know, we just go to them on an as needed basis. It's not that, um, you know, they always have them because they're all busy people. Uh, it's not that they always have to attend meetings. And they, they won't have that kind of time. But you go to them as and when needed for some guidance on specific areas. So that's the purpose of the advisory board. They're, they're there to you know, give you input, give you that guidance. So there are people who are good in their particular uh, area of expertise. So you can benefit from them. Uh, and what... So we have what is called as trustees. Um, these are the people who are legally responsible for the entity. Uh, uh, now, what we chose to do here at APC is that the trustees would be pastoral, part of the pastoral team. Uh, now, this again, a choice we made. I'm not saying it should be necessary. Um, the reason is the trustees are people who are going to actually, you know, be a little, little closer to guiding the organization so we because we are a church we wanted them to um, uh, give input that was you know spiritual in nature or you know because we are a, a church so the trustees would hold spiritual moral and legal responsibility the advisory board um, again which I mentioned was only done some years ago recently uh, the way we thought of bringing this together is to have a, a, about eight people, uh, people who come from, uh, who, are, who have expertise in certain areas, uh, uh, legal, uh, accounting, organization development, Christian missions or social work, technology, operations, the creative side, media arts side, and somebody who's in touch with uh, current trends or from a counseling perspective, urban life perspective. So we said, okay, you know, here are these eight areas where we definitely from time to time would need different kinds of inputs. Uh, so if you have these kinds of people around us, we could go to them, they could give us input. And also uh, the other thing was we wanted to balance um, experience with uh, being in touch with new developments. So we wanted some people who are over 45, so they bring experience, especially in matters that require that kind of experience. And we also needed younger people because uh, they would be in touch with what's really ha what's happening. Um, and, and so, you know, this is how we've set up. Uh, so we, uh, we don't get, you know, we don't have like a group meeting all the time, but as needed, we go to different people for specific inputs. Uh, you know, so when we need legal, we go there. Um, so that person would give us legal advice when we need accounting information. Um, so, you know, these are people available and we go to them for inputs as and when we need as we are progressing. They are there to help us uh, and uh, give us inputs and guide us and so on. So. This is how we structure it, you know, and uh, I think we can do a lot more here in, 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 in trustees and advisory board. But um, this is how we have done. And, uh, you, know, if we, you know, you, uh, in your local church, in your Christian ministry, uh, you, could, <clears throat> you could, you know, think of what works for you. Now, uh, just to give a side thought, um, it is, you know, there are pros and cons of people of having people from outside your church or ministry. Um, when you have people from outside, the advantage is they can bring a very different perspective. They can bring in uh, new ideas and thoughts. The downside is that they may not be in touch with where, what is actually happening and where, you know, the, the church or the ministry is actually going. And so sometimes their inputs could be very disconnected from the reality of what's going on. Uh, or sometimes, you know, uh, by the time they're able to understand what is happening, you know, uh, uh, 
that, I mean, for them to understand what's happening it takes a lot of time and effort so that they're not able to really meaningfully give inputs uh, to what is happening. So there are pros and cons in having people from within the church or outside the church. There are benefits, advantages and disadvantages. And so, you know, you can decide what works best for you in your given context. Okay. So let me take questions. I think maybe somebody had some questions. Uh, okay, Charles, go ahead. You have a question? Yeah, thank you. I don't know whether I didn't see it, but I was looking at the number eight. Mm -hmm. um, what what happens when it comes to the issue of voting and they are tying they are four four and they tie they, are, they mm -hmm. make a choice so how how is it handled won't an odd number be of help that was my maybe i didn't see the numbering but mm -hmm. i saw there were eight and i was like but if they are what yeah, good, good question. So, uh, so remember, there is a difference between the the trustees or the directors and the advisory board. The advisory board serves more to give you input or advice uh, based on their expertise and their knowledge. So they are not involved in the voting process or deciding process. They would give you input. So once they give the input, then the trustees or that is the people who are legally on the organization, you know, you call them directors or office bearers, the other ones who would make the decision based on the input that they receive. So that the trustees is good for them for that to be an odd number, because the other ones are going to make a decision and sometimes you have to uh, vote on something. The advisory board is more of people with, you know, uh, in expertise in different areas who can give you input as and when you need. So the advisory board is eight. It's, you know, I mean, I, I, I just identified eight areas where we could have, we would benefit from having input and you know, we go to these people. Uh, so that's why it's it's not necessary for that to be odd number. Is it okay? Thank you so much. Yeah. So for example, right now, we are busy. Um, actually, we started this project maybe in 2018. And then of course, during the pandemic, everything came to a pause. And so now we're back in it now um, in looking for land uh you know where we want to build uh of course it's mainly for our bible college campus and then of course there will be church church hall and all the other facilities hostels and so, so we uh we we formed a team from within the church but we also have an external person uh who advises us so in fact you know he's been with us throughout the journey he's still with us now and uh, he actually uh, was uh, served with the government um, from you know for his entire career. So, uh, and he was especially involved in urban development and all these kind of land, all those kinds of things with the government. So he's our advisor. So you know we go to him, and, and only if he says okay, do we go forward. So he's our advisor. You know, he's helping us in this whole journey. And so we are benefiting from his experience. And, uh, uh, and of course, he has access to the government, uh, you know, uh, information. So he can help us and guide us in this, uh, in this whole process. So, yeah. So that's, that's, the, that's how the advisory board can help the organization, you know, in, as they journey. Any other questions? Uh, all right. So Elisha's question, when is it appropriate to review the advisory board? So um, uh, 
I, I would say, you know, uh, we give the, each one uh, a time of two years. We ask them for a commitment of two years. And after that, if they want to step down, it's fine. And uh, if they want to, if they're okay to continue, that's also great. Right. So usually we keep it like a two year window where if somebody wants to step down, they can step down. If somebody wants to continue, they can continue. Uh, so we just kind of leave it flexible. But then every two years, you get a chance to, uh, you know, you bring in new people and you uh, replace others. So you, you have the option to do it. Um, so two years is a good tenure. Is that okay, Elisha? Yes, Pastor. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Christopher, go ahead. Yes, Pastor. I have uh, two questions. Um, one is with regards to this, um, uh, the, the church, you know, how it um, imparts the spiritual aspect of, uh, you know, um, the, the way it um, reaches out to, to, the, to, the, to the congregation spiritually and um, how that sort of balances off with the, you know, the, the way the, the trustees uh, govern the church. And are there any ch challenges in that? And maybe you can, you can talk through, uh, uh, you know, your, your experience. And um, the second one is about um, um, the church itself. Um, uh, is it considered to be uh, a charity organization? And um, how that uh, kind of um, is structured around, you know, providing uh, financial assistance, for example, as a, as a charity organization, um, versus trying to build the, you know, the church uh, 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 in a, in a particular city or, or across across the country. Mm. 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 Good, good questions. So the first question. I think it's very important for the trustees, that is the office bearers, the people who are legally responsible for that Christian church or Christian ministry, for them to be spiritually motivated because the local church or the Christian ministry is primarily a spiritual ministry. So if the trustees are not aligned spiritually with what the church is supposed to be doing or the Christian ministry is supposed to be doing, there can be a real clash. And then the trustees could actually become a hindrance to the spiritual ministry that is supposed to happen. Or if there is conflict in among the, 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 the office bearers, you know, the legal the directors themselves, if there's conflict there, it is going to affect the kind of ministry, spiritual ministry that will happen. Sooner or later, it will become visible. So that's very important. You know, there has to be alignment. So that is why uh, what we have done at APC is the pastoral team, many of them are also the trustees. In fact, yeah, yeah. So all our trustees are also involved in the ministry of the church. So that way there is a sync. There is um, flowing, you know, there's a connection between any kind of decision which is more administrative, organizational, legal. There's a sync uh, with the what the dis what the decisions the decisions that are made organizationally and with what has to happen spiritually to serve the people. So that's the reason we have intentionally kept it that way. And uh, you know, hopefully, it will continue that way. That all the trustees are also involved in the ministry of the church. So, uh, of the five trustees, uh, um, three are part of the pastoral team, 
and one is heading up one area of ministry and the other one is you know is, is part of the church and so on so um, there is that flowing together and all of them of course they also need to be organizationally sound you know that means they all come from a very uh, organ they come from a professional background so so that's a big blessing that means they're a, they're blending both spiritual and the professional organizational aspect and that's a big blessing right? but i have seen in organizations where somebody you know who's on the on the trust and off as an office bearer was a director who's just a professional in the sense that yeah they're believers but they're not very spiritually inclined then what happens the decisions that are being made are so disconnected from what the ministry needs to have and is is requires or what the people require and it actually disrupts the ministry and then I'm thinking of one huge, one wonderful ministry I saw, I mean, that was here in India. Uh, I, I saw before my own eyes, you know, how the ministry had expanded wonderfully. Uh, it was under a good leadership, uh, an elderly person, spiritual person, and the ministry had grown all over India. Now, he was a little elderly, older, so he stepped down. And the ministry was handed to somebody else who this person was more interested in, you know, I, I guess his own interests. So things went off in a different direction. And so then he, he, he was forced to step down and then they handed it off to somebody who was purely, uh, I would say an organization person. He had no connect with the, the needs of the people, what the ministry had done, so on. And uh, right before my eyes, I saw this organization, which was, which at one point was, you know, all across India, within a matter of one or two years, everything was gone. Very sad. So today, what was once, a, you know, a beautiful work being done all across India, has just come down to almost nothing. Uh, it's very sad. I don't know how they're going to rebuild or how it's going to come back again. But this is what I saw. And I heard people tell me from that organization, because I knew I, I, I used to work. Uh, I, they, I heard them say, you know, that this new leader has no, he doesn't understand. He doesn't know what's happening. And he's making decisions that are actually hurting the people. You know, so that's the danger there. Uh, so that's in response to your first question. Now, the second question, which is, how do you balance, you know, charity work with building the organization? You know, so that I think will vary uh, from organization to organization, depending on what their focus is. So for example, um, uh, the local church, okay, APC as a local church. So APC as a local church, we are a religious organization and we have certain focus areas. That is of course, planting of churches to spiritually equip people. Plus our focus would be to you know, equip people for the ministry that happens through the Bible College. And a focus would be to, uh, to support missions work, missions work. So these are the focus areas. So we are not into feeding the hungry so much, you know, or th that's not our main area. So, you know, feeding the hungry or giving to, you know, those other, what we would consider as charitable causes because the focus is here but we do give right so we do uh, instead of us doing it directly we would give to somebody some other ministry who's doing that kind of work so we would give to somebody who's an organization that is caring for feeding children you know or caring for uh, uh, 
rural development or caring for uh, or doing rehab kind of work. So we don't do that directly, but what we do is we give to them to help them do the work which they're doing. But we stay on our main areas, which is you know to equip people in the Word of God and the Spirit and church planting and Bible college training and missions. Those focus areas. Whereas uh, another organization may be completely devoted to you know let's feed the poor or let's let's um, help people who are in the slums or you know so to really so the answer to that question would be uh, what is the organization really focused on because that's where and that's how they will generally use their financial resources right so i hope i answered both your questions chris any any for any is it okay oh yes thank you just one uh really quick uh, follow-up question um uh, I mean, I uh, you had mentioned about this number five, so I think uh, that kind of uh, relates back to Charles's question about uh, you know having an odd number uh, in case of any sort of a vote. Um, just also to understand uh, because in, so, in some uh, organizations or even councils, uh, I think the UN actually has something like that, but they have something called a veto veto power where they can actually stop a particular uh, activity to happen, and they have that uh, that power to uh you know to um, not have something uh, you know some action to take place and i think currently right now i think for example the un i think they're just uh, you know five countries that, that can actually uh, uh you know who have that veto power so is, is does that exist uh in 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 this kind of structure of the trustees and um and uh you know has i mean in, in i mean not for apc but you know maybe for some of the large large churches uh, has that you know always worked well, um, or perhaps worked you know uh, in favor of 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 you know maybe the, the senior pastors in the in that in that uh, church. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, we don't have that at APC. Like so, we don't. No trustee has been given a veto power, uh, uh, and I have not heard of such a thing. You know. Uh, in, in the Christian ministry circles. Uh, now, of generally speaking, you know, the senior pastor, the main senior pastor is visionary, so he would present what he has, and uh, hopefully there is a consensus in the decision making and, and what's going forward. Um, there may be, of course, um, discussions like we often have when when we when we have to make important decisions you know all, all of all the trustees would share their ideas and ideas and then we try to put everything together or take the best ideas and then go forward with it um so that's how it has happened so the vision or the idea may come from the senior pastor and then it goes forward or sometimes uh you know from a pastoral side you know the day-to-day -day decisions or the short-term this which are not of big impact are, are just driven by the senior pastor and that happens so in that sense the senior pastor is a visionary and he leads and he makes decisions and so on and the trustees hopefully those decisions are more of a consensus or you know coming together but i've not heard of any uh, anyone being given a veto power uh, that i think would be very dangerous in a christian ministry setting uh, it's always better to you know have checks and balances um, uh, and uh, you know even if the senior pastor wants to go and do something especially if it's something huge and very you know has um, significant uh, ramifications it's good that the other trustees also are in line with it and otherwise you know if there's some something dangerous they should alert and say don't do it you know so i think um, it's good to have those checks and balances yeah um elisha how do you re re remunerate trustees and advisory board members so our advisory board members are completely voluntary so they don't uh, they're not paid uh, it's just a voluntary they just you know, we just go to them for advice. Uh, uh, so that's one thing. But if any of the advisory board members are working for the church in some capacity, they get paid for the work. But just as an advisory board member, that's just a voluntary thing. They just, you know, we go to them. 
Uh, for example, uh, I'm a legal person, right? He's a lawyer. So if you just ask him for some advice, yeah, he'll just share his ideas. But when we want him to do some work for us, meaning uh, some legal work for us to, uh, you know, uh, uh, between the trust and the getting some paper filing and all that, we, we have to pay him or his organization for doing that work, right? So, so we so uh, uh, the advisory board role is purely voluntary, but when any of them are doing an actual work for us, they get paid for it uh, based on their actual professional fees. Uh, the trustees. Um, the trustees who are staff, that means if, um, um, so out of the five trustees, um, one, two, um, yeah, only two are also a staff of the church. So the two get paid a salary as staff. The other three are not paid, they are, uh, you know, like volunteering because they have their own job outside. They're doing their own work outside, professional work, and they are trustees. But they're involved voluntarily with the ministry of the church. So if, if any of the trustees are staff, that means full-time paid staff, then they get paid like everybody else. Uh, uh, otherwise, they are voluntary. Okay, So you can have a combination of the two. Okay, Pastor. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Good. Uh, enjoy your questions. <laughs> it's a thing. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to proceed to the next chapter. If if you have any questions at any time, you know, feel free to uh, ask. So I'm going to go to the next chapter, which is building up on what we've done so far. So once you've got your legal entity. And your, you know, your your trustees, that is your office bearers, your advisory board. Next thing, chapter four, is to think of an organization structure for your church and ministry. Right now, obviously, this is going to evolve over time. Uh, you know, it's very rare that you would be able to start off with a with the, with the structure in place. Uh, for example, at ABC, um, when we started, uh, we you know we didn't have any staff. And that means I was I was uh, as a as a pastor, the founding pastor. Uh, uh, in those years, uh, I was not paid by the church. I was more like a volunteer pastor because I was um, I was uh, running my own business. So my financial Finances were coming to me through my business, but I was the pastor of the church, and you know everybody. We were really small, so twenty people. Everybody was just, you know, doing things. So there was no staff. There's no, you know, actual paid uh, thing, and if people were paid and so on. And I was just the one one person. We would just do things. Uh, but then slowly we added one person. Now that one person was actually paid by the company and he was handling some of the administrative work of the church. It was actually a few years later, so I would say maybe uh, almost three or four years later, and I, I, I don't exactly remember, but it's, I think it's about three or four years later that we actually started bringing or uh, uh, having full-time staff in the church. So we uh, we had uh, uh, like an administrator, we had uh, 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 a youth pastor and so on, and then a children's church pastor and so on. So we started slowly adding people. Like when we could, you know, when we had that need and when we found the right people, we slowly started uh, having paid staff for the church, but that came three or four years later. And uh, almost uh, 14, 13, 14 years later, from the time we started, I joined full time with the church. So, um, you know, so that whole period I was not a full, not a staff of the church. I was just serving, um, leading the organization, but not a staff. And then about 
in 2014 is when I moved and I became a staff of the church. So the point I want to say is this, that the structure evolved over time, the organization structure, in our case. Now, some people uh, may have a lot of money in the very beginning, and they may be able to put a structure in place. Uh, if that happens, well and good. But in most cases, I would imagine that the structure will we start with nothing, and then slowly over time, uh, you put in an organization structure. Right? So that is more likely the reality, that it will happen over time. But it is important for us to understand that as the church and as the ministry grows, you need to have an organization structure. And that's what you want to talk about in this chapter. Right? So by organization structure, organizational structure, organization structure, what we mean is that you have a clearly defined uh, set of activities. That means, uh, you know, you can call it functions or roles or responsibilities that you assign to people. And a flow, information flow, which is who makes, you know, decision making, uh, the process or how things are going to happen. So both the activities and the flow of information within the organization should be clearly defined so that, you know, whatever the organization is supposed to be doing, they are able to do it well. Okay. So the organization structure is very, very important. So now what happens generally in uh, in uh, Christian ministry is that there is no clearly uh, defined organizational structure. Uh, sometimes it's just one pastor who does everything and everybody just goes to him for everything. And um, uh, it's like, you know, they just make it happen from Sunday to Sunday or from meeting to meeting. It just, it just somehow it all comes together. And it's like one, the pastor is the, pastor, he's the event manager, he is the coordinator, he is everything, you know, for the organization. And uh, that's not a good way to work uh, because the pastor can get worn out very easily. And also the dependence on the pastor is too much, you know. So it's always good to create a structure where things can happen and things can flow like, you know, like they say, like a well-oiled machine you know so you think about that now there are different types of organizational structures there could be a structure that's functional in nature that means that is based on various functions example worship team children's church or uh, or, or if you want to and that's i'm talking about ministry functions or even administrative type of functions accounting um you know uh, media, IT, so on. So you could have, uh, bio, you can create your structure based on these functions. Or you can have something that's more divisional, you know, or multi-divisional. So the divisions could be geographic, like you could say, you know, you divide your country, or your city, your country, whatever, north, south, east, west, and uh, you create, you know, the northern region team for the southern region, so on and so forth. You could do, do division like that, or you can do division based on department type divisions. You know, um, specific ministry areas. Okay, this is a ministry that is geared towards children. This is the ministry that's geared towards um, adults, and so on. So that those could be divisions uh, or departments in your organization. So. You could have a structure that's around functions. You could have a structure that's around divisions. Could be different things, whether it's uh, demographic or geographic, uh, or the kind of service that's being provided, the ministry that's being provided. Or you could have completely flat. You know that is everybody's in the same level almost. Uh, they may be leaders, but then more or less it's flat. And then you just organize around work that needs to be done, tasks. So people are working very, very, very fluid. 
or you could have a matrix. A matrix is a combination of functional and division. So you kind of mix the two. That's called a matrix. Right? So uh, initially when we started, uh, we of course, you know, uh, began with certain functions. Uh, like I said, there was a youth pastor, there was a children's church pastor, there was an administrator. And then as the functions increased, we had more people come in. Then later on, we started doing by division, north, south, east, west. So now we have more of a matrix structure that uh, has functions and divisions. And people kind of also uh, work across that. So the matrix structure allows people to kind of move between functions and divisions. So example, we have a worship team. But the worship team is, is functional, but is also moving across north, south, east, west, so on. So people move across our divisions, so to speak. So it's a matrix structure. So there is uh, people moving around. But then people, the challenge in the matrix structure is people should be very clear on whom they report to, whom they are going to be answerable to, right? So a worship people in the worship team they are answerable to the worship pastor while, but at the same time, when they go to a particular location, that they go to the North Church, they're also answerable to the associate pastor at the North Church, right? So, so it's kind of like a dual accountability. That means uh, they're ultimately accountable to the worship pastor, but when they go and serve at a location that is North, they are accountable at that in, the, in that service. They have to flow with the uh, location pastor there, right? So it's dual accountability, but things are very clear who they are finally responsible to, right? So you can you can decide. You know, as your ministry, as your church is growing, you can begin to decide what structure would work best for you. And we will get into the details uh, a little later on. I will mm, explain it. But before we get into the practical side, you know, I, I just want to point us to some places in Scripture uh, that really inspire us when it comes to organizational structure and design. And uh, I've just put a set of passages from the uh, the, the ministry of King David. Uh, it's quite amazing how you know David was. You know, like the Bible says, he was a man after God own, God's own heart. He was uh, a psalmist, the sweet psalmist of Israel. He wrote so many psalms. He was a prophet. Uh, he spoke concerning the Messiah. And of course, he was a king. And uh, so it's wonderful. David was a very deeply spiritual person. But yet, when it came to administration, he was amazing. I want us to actually read some of these scriptures. You know, if you turn with me to First Chronicles 23, uh, we just read the first six verses here and then go for our break. First Chronicles 23, can somebody read verses 1 to 6? First Chronicles 23, 1 to 6, please. So when David was old and full of days, he made his son Solomon king over Israel. And he gathered together all the leaders of Israel with the priests and the Levites. Now the Levites were numbered from the age of 30 years and above. And the number of individual males was 38,000. Of these 24,000 were to look after the work of the house of the Lord. 6,000 were officers and judges. 4,000 were gatekeepers and 4,000 praised the Lord with musical instruments, which I made, said David, for giving praise. Also David divided them into divisions among the sons of Levi, Gershon, mm. Kohath, and Merari. Mm, thank you. So just think about it. Now we've just read the first six verses, but just think about what David is doing. So really, he's setting up this this was before Solomon built the temple. So at that time, there's only a tabernacle, which means a tent-like structure 
where people would come to you know worship and sacrifice to God think about what you know how David is organizing this he's got 38,000 38,000 men who are Levites now these are Le Levites means they're going to serve in the temple they're going to be uh, help the priests so he's not talking about the priests he's talking about the Levites they're going to help around with the tabernacle 38,000 men can you imagine 38,000 people serving in a particular local church but that's what's you know you that's what's kind of happening here so in this tabernacle in Jerusalem when David is building this thing he's got 38,000 helpers then he actually breaks them down into groups so he's got uh, 24,000 who are going to look after the work of the house of the Lord 6,000 were officers and judges more like you would call them as line managers or you know uh, people to make sure things are going fine then he's got gatekeepers 4,000 gatekeepers and then he's got 4,000 musicians so he has organized them 38,000 people he's broken them down into different teams what we would call as teams it says you guys you take care of the of just all the you know the arrangements in the temple you guys are like the leaders who are going to oversee you guys are the gatekeepers you make sure who's coming in who's going out the flow of traffic uh, take care of that and you guys are the musicians you're going to make sure that there is praise and worship going on in the tabernacle it's quite fascinating and think of this this is old testament david has not been to any management school he's not got any organizational structure training <laughs> nothing like that but he has organized the tabernacle of how just the administrative side how things should run in the tabernacle very fascinating let me pause here we will just come back to this uh, after the break um, uh, and uh, you know we'll pick up think about this uh, we'll go for a quick break we'll come back in 10 minutes and continue thank you <laughs> 